UW360 is proudly supported by Pacific Office Automation, Copy, Print, Workflow, and IT, Problem Solved. Today on UW360, as the UW student body grows, find out how its campus might grow along with it, with a peek at the university's new campus master plan. Plus, how one UW researcher's dream to reveal life at the bottom of the ocean, live, is now a reality. Also, the life-changing and life-saving work being done at the UW Medicine's Neurosciences Institute. And the incredible story of the UW women's golf team and their national championship season, all on today's UW 360. Hi everyone, from the University of Washington, I'm Carolyn Douglas. Welcome to UW 360. More than 150 years ago, the University of Washington began with just one building and a handful of students. Today, this beautiful campus is home to more than 45,000 students and growing. And the campus continues to grow along with them. Today, we get a peek at the ideas behind a new campus master plan that will guide construction and development on campus for the next 10 years. Austin Seatontop reports. Over 45,000 students attend the University of Washington Seattle campus, and that number is growing. By 2028, the UW is expected to have over 52,000 students in Seattle, and that's why to manage growth, the UW has created an updated campus master plan. The Campus Master Plan details 10 years of development within the university's boundaries starting in 2018 to create new spaces for students, faculty, and staff. And it's taken years for Teresa Doherty and the Campus Master Plan team to put it all together. So the Campus Master Plan is, in a nutshell, the written document that guides our physical development. We would see about a six million square feet of development uh, occurring on campus. So that six million square feet of development would occur on approximately 40 different development sites. We've identified 85, but during the life of the plan, we think we'll only need to build on about half of those. With this flexible framework, campus's development will respond to the university's needs as it grows. And one of those needs has already been identified. The plan will help create an innovation district on campus, something Vikram Jandiala has been working on with CoMotion for several years. The kind of innovation we are talking about is inclusive innovation. That is, it's not just technology or biotechnology, but it's about creativity and, and solving societal problems. It's about creating societal impact. In fact, the mission of ProMotion, which is the collaborative innovation hub, is to accelerate the societal impact of innovations coming out from the university. The plan has development sites in West Campus to create mixed-use spaces where students and faculty from across all different disciplines can meet with representatives from local government and businesses to find new solutions to the world's problems. That is the critical uh, difference between innovation which works and innovation which doesn't, which is getting people together in spaces where they normally don't encounter each other. The sort of water cooler conversation between a social scientist and a computer scientist and an engineer and an artist. With more students, the arrival of light rail just off 43rd Street in 2021, and these new mixed-use collaborative spaces, it could be a big win for people all over the entire U District, like Lois Coe, the owner of Sweet Alchemy Ice Creamery. We are very excited that this place will have a lot more foot traffic coming in. Um, the businesses on the Ave will really feel the difference, I feel like. Well, we do have several development sites along 15th so that if and when those sites are chosen to be developed, they will be developed in such a way as the retaining wall that's there right now will be taken down, and they'll be designed so that they're encouraging people to come into campus. I feel great about the University of Washington opening up more towards the app. With that wall coming down and also the 43rd becoming a more of a green street, um, it, it sounds wonderful. The future holds a lot in store for the UW, and the Campus Master Plan provides a framework to make sure that campus grows flexibly in response to needs as they arise, although only time will tell what the university will look like in 10 years. The Campus Master Plan and its accompanying environmental impact report are available online. The final drafts of each should be completed in early 2017 and will then be presented to the Seattle City Council for approval. 
Still ahead, travel with us to the bottom of the Pacific Ocean and see how one UW professor has fulfilled his dream to show the world the live eruption of an undersea volcano. Plus, restoring history, the art and science behind the restoration of rare books and how UW conservationists are saving precious books from the library graveyard and how the UW's women golf team took a swing at the NCAA championship and won as UW 360 continues. The following UW 360 story is made possible by the generous support of BECU. BECU, more than just money. Welcome back to UW360. It was dreamed up in a bar 25 years ago, an idea to place live cameras and data recorders on the bottom of the ocean. Now, after decades of work, that dream of one UW professor is a reality and showing the world things never before seen by the human eye. <laughs> We're bringing a ray of light in the form of fiber optic cables into the dark, deep portion of our planet that is so crucial. Oceanography professor John Delaney is the driving force behind the undersea cabled array off the Washington, Oregon coast. Nearly 600 miles of fiber optic cable with cameras and well over 100 sensors and specimen collectors definitely qualifies as an extreme environment. Dana Manalang is an engineer from the university's Applied Physics Lab, one of many dozens at the U who have helped plan or run this system. We've built a, an extension cord that reaches into the ocean. So 24 hours a day, seven days a week, we're monitoring uh, seismic activity, chemical signatures, all in the ocean that, that we weren't able to measure before. The cabled array went online in September of 2014. The idea? To allow everyone access to the information coming back. They were able to actually track individual whales off our coast which has never been done before. University of Washington professor Deborah Kelly has just returned from a voyage to help make repairs and updates to the cabled array. In April of 2015, a highlight, the most comprehensive live data from an erupting underwater volcano ever delivered. And we could watch the precursors to that eruption, which is um, Lots and lots of earthquakes are too small to pick up on land, but our new infrastructure can pick it up in real time. The seafloor literally dropped in about 12 to 14 hours, almost seven and a half feet. That's pretty cool. So that was unprecedented. No one had ever made those kinds of measurements. The information streaming in is expected to provide new insights in biology, chemistry, pharmaceuticals, environmental science, and far beyond. But really going the next step and starting to do things like harvest energy and not rely on shore-based power. We have the map here. With the most extensive cabled array in the United States successfully launched, the UW team is now pondering ways to expand deep sea exploration and understanding. We're going to be able to set up natural laboratories over entire areas where Ecosystems of the, of the global ocean are unfolding rapidly but cryptically. The ocean is effectively our life support system and we must understand how it works. The National Science Foundation is one of the key partners on the UW's cabled array. There's also an extensive array off the southern tip of Vancouver Island and other countries have smaller arrays or they're working to develop similar systems. Okay, now from one dream to another, the University of Washington has one of the largest college library systems in the country and contains many extremely old and rare books. Many of those precious old books are in need of some serious repair. Now, thanks to a brand new library conservation center, those tattered old books are getting a new lease on life.
Using special collections can be kind of intimidating for students. And one of my major jobs is trying to lessen the barriers. And for the first time, now that we have the Conservation Center, I'm able to do some selective choosing of material that I feel has a place in the classroom, is something that I know my faculty will be interested in using, and is something that is not unreasonable to ask Justin and the other people in the Conservation Center to do. My work is specifically on female authors in the 18th century. The first time I got to actually hold a first edition or a very rare uh, collection of poetry, seeing it for the first time is just so exciting because you read them in modern editions, but once you're actually holding a book that someone of the time might have been holding themselves, it's just, you know, there's nothing like it. What the Conservation Lab is doing is it's allowing us to put in the hands of students, and many times undergraduates, materials that I haven't been able to do that with because they're falling apart. When I started here and you used the word conservation, people thought you meant trees. Every single book that we have in the collection can be looked at as this irreplaceable resource because the university could not really go out and buy these again. We have this wonderful book that's a history of serpents. The title page has a giant boa constrictor on it uh, with a baby in its mouth and a very fat tummy, obviously having eaten lots of babies. And when I started this job in 1968, the front cover of that book was off. And it's a beautiful binding, but we didn't let anybody use it because it, the text was too fragile to handle. When Justin started here, it was one of the first books I gave him to look at to sort of see what he had to say about it. And he said, oh, that'll be easy. And in two hours, he fixed something that hadn't been able to be in anybody's hands for, you know, almost 40 years. The book, the technology of the actual physical book, as long as you have conservation, you have decent environmental conditions, they're going to be around for hundreds, if not thousands of years. Those conservationists are not likely to run out of work anytime soon. They repair, bind, or make enclosures for more than 10,000 items a year. Still ahead, raising the national championship trophy with the UW women's golf team. But first, the science of understanding and treating the nervous system and the brain, and how UW doctors use their expert knowledge to help save one woman's life. As UW 360 continues. This portion of UW 360 is presented by the UW Neurosciences Institute. Welcome back to UW360. The UW Medicine's Neurosciences Institute can't be found on a map. It's a virtual institute of experts and providers who treat patients with disorders of the nervous system, everything from chronic headaches to strokes and Parkinson's disease. And as Stacy Sakamoto shows us, their care can be life-changing, even life-saving. May 5th, uh, 2009, apparently, and I'm just telling you this based on what my husband told me because I don't remember. Denise Moss still fights back tears when she talks about the blood vessel that ruptured in her brain. She was home alone, caring for her young daughters when a family member found her unconscious on the floor. She does remember waking up in the hospital. That's when she learned she'd underwent a 12-hour surgery because she'd been born with an arterial venous malformation, or an AVM. It's a tangle of blood vessels in the brain, and they ruptured, causing a stroke. Waking up in, in the rehab section and my husband, you know, handing me a mirror, me saying, can I see the back of my head? Oh my gosh, you know, and I, went, I, just, went through, I just went through all of that. What happened to me? 
But Denise made a complete recovery, one of thousands of patients of the UW Medicine's Neurosciences Institute. I tell people all of the time that I feel so blessed to live here and have Harborview because without Harborview, I, pro I, don't, I really don't think I'd be here. In the Neurosciences Institute, we see everything from the patient perspective. We see it from the human side. What do patients want? They want the most cutting edge care that they can get in the world. They want to know that they're coming to UW to get the best in the world. The brain is unquestionably uh, the body's most mysterious organ. It's the only organ in our bodies whose primary function, memory, thinking, feeling, personality, those things we simply don't understand. To be able to care for patients that have neurologic disorders is the most challenging thing that medicine has undertaken. And I feel that every day. Some patients, like Denise, are treated for strokes. Knock, knock. Others come for treatment of other neurological Good disorders, including Parkinson's, you? multiple sclerosis, epilepsy, or headaches. The Institute's work also attracts residents from all over the country, including Chiba Ene, who loves the balance of research and clinical practice. There are very few programs in the country that offer what UW offers. One of the biggest factors for me was research. Okay. I want you to close your eyes. We take you research that like we discover in the laboratories and bring it to their bedside so that they know, you know, I'm gonna get the best in the world right here in Seattle, Washington. Patients like Denise Moss are forever grateful for that expertise. I look in the mirror and I think about it every day, but in a good way. I think about it how life is short and I don't take anything for granted. Some patients are referred to the Neurosciences Institute by their primary care providers. Other patients find out about the Institute by doing their own research. In Denise's case, she ended up under the care of one of the Institute's surgeons because paramedics had rushed her to Harborview Medical Center. Up next, the first ever NCAA championship for the UW women's golf team. And oh, how sweet it was. We'll relive the wild ride and meet the coach who waited more than 30 years to coach a national title team as UW 360 continues. Welcome back to UW 360. Late spring of 2016 will go down in history as a championship season for UW. That's when the Husky women's golf team shocked the world and captured the dog's first NCAA golf title, a win that's still being felt today at the University of Washington and beyond. Aaron Mayofsky shows us how it all happened. And the Washington Huskies have won their first ever Women's Division I Golf Championship. The excitement runs deep, a national championship beating Stanford on the second hole of sudden death. You know, you're in the best conference in the country. Uh, you, you play against the best teams in the country week in and week out. So for us, that's the challenge. That's what you want to do. That's how you get better. It's been dream come true, no, no doubt about that, to have the success, you know, most people don't go 33 years without winning a national championship. Um, some people go over their whole careers without winning one, and um, to, to win it with this group, it's just been incredibly rewarding and, and gratifying. But securing the title wasn't easy. Nerve-wracking. Whoops, Ooh. yeah, may have changed. Nail-biting. It's for birdie to win the hole. A clutch performance. Quick it, it just, is extraordinary. That's since early on, <laughs> wow. Oh, look at that. That was big. Again, this is the first extra hole. To have a freshman step up in that situation. That? And the day before, you know, she doesn't hold that bunker shot. We're probably not sitting here having this conversation. I mean, that was just a phenomenal, phenomenal display of execution under the kind of pressure that, that I'm sure was the most pressure she's ever had on her on a golf course. I mean, it was everything just combined, just anxiety, just butterflies, and 
I was shaking and just eventually, like before the bunker shot, I was, it was getting so bad, my mind just completely went blank. I just, I just pretty much shut down. <laughs> I just kind of stopped thinking about everything and stopped caring about what everyone would say, whether I like got up and down, whether I made it, whether I scolded it 30 yards over. Um, I just stopped caring about that and just kind of focused in on what needed to be done. In any sport, there's a high amount of stress, an intense amount of pressure, and in golf, making that critical shot can mean the difference between losing or winning. And this year's championship team definitely knows how to de-stress. And now I'm gone! They started the carpool karaoke. It's just a way to blow off steam. You know, everybody's laughing. It really kept things loose and uh, easy going, and, and that's what we want. And building team camaraderie, plus the national championship, gives the dogs a great launching pad to tee up bigger and better things. When you get to nationals, you know, that feeling that you have inside, it's crazy. I've never had it before, and um, it's every golfer's dream. But what's special about this national championship, not only is it the Huskies' first since the softball team won it all in 2009, it can be contagious for all the Huskies teams. Mary Lou's always done things the right way, and to see that pay off in a national championship is obviously the penultimate thing in sports. It's not the uniform, it's what's inside the uniform, and we still believe in that. College golf has one of the longest seasons in sports. They play during the fall and then again in late winter and spring. Next year's NCAA championships are in May in Illinois. And that does it for this edition of UW360. If you'd like more information on any of the stories you saw today, just head to our website at uwtv.org slash uw360. You'll also find us on Facebook and Twitter. I'm Carolyn Douglas. Thank you for watching. And we'll see you next time with all new stories from the University of Washington.